Welcome everyone to Epoch Philosophy, just in podcast form. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel, podcast, everything at large at Epoch Philosophy as a whole. Consider pledging a couple dollars a month to help keep this entire project alive and get access to some really cool perks like early access to videos, voting on future videos, Discord access, editing tutorials, and the like. Without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Okay, everyone. I have Labor Kyle with me today. We are going to talk some labor history and all that fun stuff. So, uh, Kyle, if you want, for anyone who's not familiar with you, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. And uh, for anyone who isn't familiar with me, my name's Kyle. I'm an, uh, an academic uh of sorts and an historian of kinds and a writer uh in a white um <laughs> who i've got a youtube channel where i uh, you can find me at labor kyle and everything if you want to follow me i have a youtube channel where i talk about uh culture and capitalism and history and uh sort of a, 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 an extent an extent an extensive variety of topics within culture uh, I like to talk about films and television and video games and all of, you know, just about anything you can get your hands on within the context of, uh, you know, theories of the subject, um, ideas around historical agency, um, ideology as a, as a, as a concept and as a sort of, you know, an imposition on a contemporary moment. And, uh, you know, whatever I want, because that's YouTube. Uh, and, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's been great so far, but yeah. Um, yeah. I'm labor Kyle on everything. If I said that already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Follow me if they want. Yeah. YouTube, YouTube doing what you want on YouTube is YouTube at its best. But, uh, I, I think what's really, uh, you know, what's kind of cool is, um, I think as a lot of people know, I, even though we have a, th- I have a theory and philosophy channel, um, I'm not even like, I'm not even educated in philosophy really like formally, like, and me and you are both kind of historians or at least that I like, you know, my undergraduate, one of my undergraduate degrees is in history. And, um, so that's kind of cool. I don't think I've ever, you know, regarding this channel, I don't think I've ever had a discussion with someone who's actually, you know, been quote unquote educated in the realm of history itself. But there's a, I, I find that to be with theory and philosophy and all that fun stuff, it's a little bit ignored, right? Like we, we kind of forget that history sort of kind of determines everything, right? Like you can't, you almost have to look at theory and philosophy from a historical backdrop yet at the same time, we, you know, it's, it's easy to forget that we're actually, you know, you know, when you're learning philosophy, you're actually also learning history. And that's something that can kind of be forgotten. Um, There's even, you know, more important things like uh, a lot of people don't realize, like um, history of philosophy or history of ideas. I think that's when people ask me kind of like what I am, you know, like some people in yeah. philosophy departments, they're like, oh, I'm a, I'm a philosopher. I would never call myself that. But I, I think the one term that I am a little bit more comfortable with identifying as is a historian of ideas. Like, that's actually what I, I, I kind of will tell people sometimes. Like, if, if anything, yeah. like what I'm interested in is like ideas philosophy uh things within a historical context and i don't think a lot of people would initially think that but i think that's uh i think it's really cool having someone on that's uh a little bit more i guess well versed in the realm of academic history and all that fun stuff yeah that's kind of how we got connect that's kind of how we sort of connected in the first place besides just through the general sort of like youtube theory philosophy sphere because i'm often um uh, sort of uh, uh, categorized in a similar way. A lot of people think that I have formal training in philosophy. <laughs> um, I have a few courses from my undergraduate education and then otherwise have done all of my reading within the context of history. Um, people don't really understand the... Uh, there, there, there are two things that is hard to understand, I think, for people who don't in- work with these with theories of history and with philosophy and the capital T theory, as we call it, sort of, you know, theory after the, you know, early and middle parts of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, 
is that there's this first of all this kind of estuary between thinking around philosophy and historical thinking um and writing around philosophy and historical writing and we hear a lot of people bring up a lot of people who place an emphasis on philosophical inquiry and questions bring up ideas of history um and invoke history but oftentimes within the public sphere of history public history being something that's a, a integrated very much into everyone's lives through your primary education and stuff like that you don't hear much about historiography the philosophy of historical writing as a uh History is this idea that my common parlance is that history is something that that we forget does not exist outside of human consciousness. So in the same way that we write and we think about the world philosophically, when we write and we think about the world historically, we are doing the work of historiography and writing in a particular way um, with particular goals um, within these sort of within these sort of like uh fluid spaces on the boundaries of the discipline because just as you were saying the discipline itself is so totalizing um from its early days as the you know from the early days of the seminar in the german empire up through the uh idea of the history of systems of thought in the foucauldian sense his sort of self-defined appointment um as a as a historian of thought systems um really for me i i was i i came to history um through the the history of like working class movements and labor history which we'll talk about later but um studied in undergrad the history of antiquity because i started out in religion and at a christian university so i took greek and I knew some of the languages and I had worked with the sources. And so by the time I dropped out of college and then went back to state school, um, I would found myself working in ancient history and classics. Now, in conversation with my academic advisor, he pointed me toward uh, something I hadn't heard of at the time, which we can call intellectual history, which is this sort of idea of historical writing that exists, um, sort of that can lie atop the sort of history of philosophy while also incorporating not just the people who thought of things, but what they thought and to think of thing of, of systems of thought in such a way that incorporates all of that into this sort of like history of th- th- an intellectual history that, um, it, that cuts across traditional demarcations in the way that we see history as this, thing in a museum or this thing we talk about in school or this thing that's portrayed in pop culture or rather than this living breathing way of thinking and way of seeing that exists beyond our sort of individual subjectivity but as this shared collective idea amongst all people no matter how much we're thinking about it and what way we're thinking about it to what degree, at what level, whatever sort of measure you want to put on it, history is being acted out in the lived experiences around us and then documented in a particular way. And so it's important to have a stake in that conversation, right? Like, why would I leave that, you know, if I'm interested in philosophy and I'm trained in history, um, there's no way that I'm going to sort of like allow to, to not assert a way of thinking within that discipline um, rather than just, you know, going and allowing, you know, my work to speak for itself in the particular sort of historical specialization that I came up, came up in, which is, you know, history of like crowds and social history, as well as the social formations of the family and the production of text within those contexts in the Roman Empire and the late Republic into the early empire, the emergence of Christianity. That's all fine and great, but what is the stuff above and around and outside of that in terms of the history? Um, how are we writing it? How are we reading it? Um, there's so much more as as we know when you have to take when you take undergrad history classes they make you take a theory class 
And then all of a sudden you're engaging with all the stuff that people talk about, all these names that people drop online from the books that they probably haven't read. Like you, like you get assigned to the first volume of the history of sexuality and essays out of the birth of the clinic and you get assigned social history and you read Marx. Like, I mean, it's not like anyone takes, but like, it's not anyone really takes Marx all that seriously necessarily, but I was assigned E.P. Thompson, Karl Marx, and Antonio Gramsci. I read Nietzsche. I read all, all of this stuff. So history is like not only an important like way of thinking and writing, but also it has like, it truly has something for everybody. Um, in the, in the up, utmost cliche, that's just kind of true. You know? Yeah, no, definitely. I, that's, well, and, and also, too, there is a, a couple points you were kind of talking about kind of going into uh, what I would almost define as like a meta history, right? Like what and, and that involves the questions of like, what exactly is history? How is it done? How is <clears throat> how does it come about uh, its emergence and stuff like that? Um, I think that's some of the best quote unquote history and academia is ones that still contend with that because like like it doesn't matter that it's 20. 21 we those are still very very valid questions uh i think that scares a lot of historians like i my personal experience um is with with history um and history departments is a lot of historians really don't like that they practice history within an already established set lens and to ever go outside of those quote unquote bounds is to almost according sort of to them they probably don't think this like consciously but it's like in action you're almost disgracing what history is in some way there's this very overly positivistic notion around the bounds of what you can do within history and and it kind of isn't a very creative endeavor and that's what i like i think intellectual history like you were talking about that is the, the sort of um the history that i think is is really worth engaging with um i had kind of one professor who was very cool and the only one in my department who actually liked any of my writing um i you have to in my department it was it's extremely rigorous the school i went to i don't know why uh i think it's almost uh, it's kind of funny they're they're a humanity so they have a really big chip on their shoulder you know neoliberal capitalism they have to prove their fucking worth and they throw oh my god i mean it is a rigorous ass program for history nonetheless i had to write a big old thesis and uh my main sort of thesis like advisor the one who taught that she's actually the head of the department absolutely hated it absolutely hated it but it went into a lot of uh, a lot of um uh, what you would describe almost like theoretical history around what the bounds of history is how can we define it i kind of toyed around with I, I this isn't i don't necessarily actually agree quote unquote like identify with this or, or, or completely agree but i used a pretty marxist notion of materialism historical materialism just to kind of play around with rather than like owning it or anything like that i think right. history can absolutely be defined as something way more broad than just historical materialism nonetheless i i sort of use historical materialism to talk about like some of the uh colonial issues of the time of like the 15th and 16th century and all of that fun stuff um but nonetheless uh i think what kind of like i think what you probably see too is like i i think history is whenever it's it's played with it's it's toyed with it's uh kind of a, a more elastic endeavor um and i think this is why me and you like continental philosophy as well i think the same thing exists within philosophy departments right uh analytical philosophers really don't like continentals um so much so that within the 20th century we saw continental philosophers get pushed into literature departments <laughs> they were like nope you can't you don't belong here get out of here you do co- you do complet now you're a professor of german now exactly exactly <laughs> And that's it's true. I I had a I had a film. I had a man. This dude. This dude. I, I probably more well read on like philosophy than like a lot of uh, philosoph like philosophy professors within that sort of department at my university. Uh, and he was a film studies person, but I mean he's yeah. he read like literally every German idealist. Like it's it, like it, people I didn't even know existed. I had no idea what their names were. He's read like their entire thing. Nonetheless, uh, he is not technically he does not teach any philosophy. He just teaches film study, but <laughs> he's very yeah. much interested in it. But no, I I, I think like. We're not done with what history is. We're not done with the sort of structural bounds of of how it exists and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I think I'm I'm kind of with you there where like the almost emergent material like sort of uh, structure of how like of how history operates 
it always begs a number of questions that go beyond just, you know, like, oh, what happened at this time? It's like, okay, well, how do we define on what this is historically? And that, that's my that's my favorite kind of history. Yeah, it like there's this there's this necessary like and like Marxism is a decent example or or a, a sort of a, a Marxist a Marxist way of analyzing capital uh, which which I think is is necessary for there there are there are a lot of different ways that people have told the histories of capitalism there are new ones and there are older ones and there are there's there's this necessary reliance on the sort of an antagonism against the post ideological formation of the university itself that I think helps clarify um, and refocus the point of writing and doing history rather than this sort of like we they because I think you're right the history department see there's a, there's this there's this big sort of post ideological like disease if you will <laughs> that uh makes its way through history departments to where we've reached this point they're like yeah we've reached this point after the like the cultural turn of the 1980s and within that turn the micro historical turn that came with historians like what brilliant and this is my opinion brilliant historians like Natalie Zeman Davis and like this this is sort of like spilled over into popular the way that we discuss popular history and it allows people to kind of like have an impact on culture and we can have our panels and we can have uh, we have our staff unions now that we fought for after it like when all of us were you know full of piss and vinegar after coming out of the student movement in the 60s and the 70s after 1968 and now we all have graduate degrees we have our teachers unions and we have everything that we need really and so we've reached a point to where everyone can have their project and everyone can have all, all those, you know, kooky ideologues in the department can have their little projects in the same way that I can have my sort of micro historical project. And we can we can focus on the expansions within the own borders of our discipline rather than uh, sort of an emphasis on interdisciplinary inquiry. But also you need to be a little interdisciplinary, but not too much. Uh, too much, then we don't know what to do with you. Um, and we should embrace ways of seeing and thinking and being that exist within a... that really end up just kind of like reformulating the same kind of like... It has this kind of, for lack of a better term, there's this, there's this performance within capitalist realism in a neoliberal history department that has this like... I was sitting in a seminar one time and my least favorite professor in graduate school um, was uh, doing a, there. It was, it was actually it was a talkback section from three faculty members in the history department, two that I liked and one that I still have nightmares about. <laughs> who uh, is this professor? Was had made most of his name writing fiction, but he had an appointment in the history department. He had had it for a long time, um, and he had this like he's one of those professors that i showed up to a graduate colloquium and he's like okay this is the syllabus from the last time i taught this class but i thought that we could just like sort of update it together which like dude i know you just didn't update your syllabus <laughs> like, you, like you, I'm, bu I'm buying the group educational activity line no i'm not doing that clearly you just didn't do your job but he at, at a session when we're all sitting in listening to very intelligent professors talk about their, I'm sure, very good books, but very niche books about, you know, one of them was about, he was a medieval historian. Uh, I can't remember. See, so I can't remember what his book was about. And another guy wrote a book about pirates. Really nice guy, good professor. I was his TA. I'm sure his book was great. I know people who have read it. Uh, but then this third professor, who I hate, got up and said, uh, everyone, look around you. This is radical what we're doing today and i almost openly booed him because i was so <laughs> mad like dude no it's not no it's not if there's anything there's nothing that is radical about us performing <laughs> the the f main per the main functions of the academy of the neoliberal academy by like 
These are people. One of the, one of those one of those poor guys. The professor I was a TA for was isn't he wasn't even a professor. He he was an instructor. He wasn't even on tenure track. Mm. But they they brought him in because he had a book published. But he wasn't on ten, tenure track, so it wouldn't have counted toward a tenure position for him. Uh, one guy who was on tenure clock, so he has to write a book. And then this third guy who just likes to blow smoke up people's asses because it makes him feel better about himself. It was just like we have a precarious academic, an a mobile academic who's probably overworked, and uh, a full professor who thinks what he's doing is the most radical thing in the world, and a whole room full of underpaid graduate students and like contingent faculty and everyone who's just like what it's just like it's like we all we gathered around the string quartet to watch as the Titanic is just like f- slowly over two hours sinking into the ocean. This is like not, it's not radical. And it's because there is no s- larger sense goal or radicalism, not in even in like a Marxian sense, because like, I, th- I think people would expect me to be much more of a rigid Marxist than I actually mm-hmm. am. Um, but in, in a sense that like, can like how how are we defining the necessary confines and goals of this discipline um and do we not have opportunities to think about a new way of sort of organizing ourselves and doing things alongside of you know writing and producing historical scholarship i don't know it just has this like we've become so like it's hard. It's 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 hard to imagine something different. That's it, not worse. It sounds like you're talking a little bit. Uh, I've always thought this talking about like the split subject and how we interact yeah. within sort of larger structures, right? Like yeah. we're doing this radical thing, yet you know, so our you know the very subconscious or unconscious isn't allowing you know, say this professor to truly analyze the full bounds of what is actually going on, despite what he yeah. thinks is actually going on. You know. Um, no, I, I find that like, and, and again, too, you know, this is, you know, you, you brought up Fisher's capitalist realism. Um, people kind of like to shit on Fisher uh, a little bit because he's, you know, he's very closely tied to a lot of what Jameson wrote. But I, I still can't think of a central theory or like language that capitalist real that, that is almost like that that isn't more relevant right now. Um I think that's totally right. And that exists everywhere. It's like even like the, you know, the, the notion of like being radical often isn't like you said, it's very performative and it's not to say that, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, it's funny. You said like performance. It made me think of everyone going ape shit around AOC's dress. It's not to say that like, you know, everything performative is bad. Who, you know, like, no, there's, yeah. Mark Fisher, Mark Fisher would have loved that dress. Everybody Probably. Needs to shut the fuck up. You need to <laughs> shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about. Clearly you didn't read the book. Like <laughs> it, it, that, that whole thing, man, if I actually, I want to thank everyone for talking about that dress for two days because it's gotten me to not go on Twitter because it's been so insufferable. Dude, oh, <laughs> it's bad. It will, you know, it's even, it, what's even funnier is that like, like one okay if you do think it is performative uh and it's not very useful fine but like like people are like look at look at this like she's just you know this is just performance art i'm like she's at the met gala man like i don't know what that's you really- want that's the point <laughs> that's yeah like that it's like almost like i i i i get if someone is a purely performative politician not only that like you know like when people the there's an almost anti fetish of uh aoc uh, and i i talk about this from the bounds primarily of left fellow left wingers it's like it's it's they're they're so like a lot of these people will shit uh, like rightfully uh, talk about how god awfully uh, passive like god awfully like um, I, I want to say like non effective electoral politics are and and they're correct with that yet they focus on electoral politics ironically there's like a little bit of a dialectic going and going on with that uh, it's like it's like all right so you sit and bitch about AOC twenty four seven isn't your whole thing that like electoral politics it's it's permanently like uh you know it's permanently sort of like structured within the bounds of again capitalism and 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 it's like it, Okay, like if if these politicians have no power, which you're correct to say, why are you focused on them all the time? You know, it's well, that's completely true. And there is this sense of like, 
we're talking about the sense of the subject in capitalism, there is a subject stasis that is persistent. Like, mm-hmm. ha- like it finds its most persistent mode in these sort of symbolic exchanges yeah. that can be absolutely persistent in like historical frameworks as we've been talking about. But it, even in contemporary culture, there is like this, there is like, they like, in in the persistence of the way that we scream e- at each other on the internet, we have in a new and additional way been dissolved into exchange value to sort of like paraphrase the Deleuzian paraphrase of Marx. Like our the 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 value of ourselves in and of ourselves has been dissolved into the sort of process of in this case negative exchange that exists around what is largely in and of itself a disrupt a disruption in other processes of exchange so are we like this this this, 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 really what it brings me to is like there's we have our problem is this feedback and it's a problem of history and it, you know it, it brings us perfectly back to you know what we've been talking about we we have no we we have no center for our sense of power and we have no sort of fixed idea of what it means to be historical um we don't think historically something very important to frederick jameson i think a big contrib- contribution of jameson's work is the idea of always historicizing yep um, something that so many of us can agree on, which is what I like about that. It has this, it bridges this gap between sort of like the, you know, sort of like our slipped, our, our various slips into subjectivity and what that, what we do after that, you know, as a, you know, you know, like, do we re, do, do we build on to and within the boundaries of a, of a, a, an eminent desire that comes from an, Oedipal formation, or do we do so in this schizophrenic post Oedipal kind of formation? Regard, like, really, like it, like what we need to accept when we're thinking historically is that we're part of the to probably horribly butcher and paraphrase uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri. We're at the heart of a center of power that doesn't establish itself as a territorial center. So it doesn't fixate itself on boundaries and barriers in the same way that it used to. It's decentered in deterritorializing in a way that incorporates frontiers that were not seen as being. It's not something that was able to be able to be incorporated within. Like it, it's completely remade and changed things and makes people new. And now it does so at a rate that it can be hard to sort of keep up and center ourselves as subjects. And so how are we supposed to be, how are we supposed to think of ourselves as historical subjects, much less any form of a, like, are, are, how are we supposed to come to the very center of what it means to be a person when we can't even think historically? And so rather than placing artificial limitations on ourselves via how history has sort of formed itself into a discipline within the neoliberal academy instead we need to be embracing history as a way of looking seeing thinking and being that becomes very useful when you center that like we were talking about labor history it becomes very useful when you center the goals of collectivity and collective expression on the emergence of a historical sense of being and really what i mean by that i was thinking about it in three ways I think about sort of a goal of collective expression within history as historicity itself being this idea that like a, an idea of r- authentically represented history or historical authenticity in general, we, we, how there is this sort of, if we can, whether we can presume a historical phenomena agent sort of exists beyond our immediate, the, our immediate understanding as subjects. We know that labor and capital within all of these contexts are defined by their crises. And so as a result, when we think historically, we begin to perform historically because that goes into the sort of the second way that I've always thought about it, which is the idea of a a philosophical sense of recognition that's 
emerges out of conflict in places like work and in the workplace in general. We have this sense of like our sense of immediacy and our grounding in a sense of things as they are, our ability to like capture our sense of self. Um, we get new levels of clarity in moments of collectivity. The idea that I talked about it in a video, um, this is a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about recently on YouTube. Uh, th this idea that recognition allows us to understand that, that even, even if there's lack within our desire and that we desire to desire that lack is something of an affirmation of the idea that we can't make change the change that we want to see by ourselves. And mm -hmm. so a theory of recognition within collectivity helps capture our sense of self um, by defining us by what we aren't. And then really all of it boils down to, and this is the most exciting and interesting part about thinking historically and theoretically about history is that we define ourselves by our ability to demarcate territory and traverse boundaries. The idea that historical demystification comes from uh, the establishment of institutions and ability to build on the exterior um, as far as the as far as we can see, um, and our ability to build across traditional boundaries, say between the academy. In between, think of the, you think of think of the the merging of student and worker uprisings in 1968 in Paris and that kind of a thing. Um, there's just there's this plasticity in his in living historically that allows for way new ways of thinking that I think people don't encounter, um, especially not anymore considering the. Like, I mean, I know apparently Fukuyama says that, like, we should start thinking about socialism again or whatever. So truly the simulation has, be, like, like, shit's gotten weird. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, we still have this, like, there, like, there is still this, like, rigor of our, of the institutions and the ways of thinking and the systems of thought that have come to, like, dominate our horizon of expectation that we still have to work really hard to change. And the only way to do that is to try and serve as some, you know, try and recognize ourselves as historical agents, as a means for building something that's not the stupid shit that we have now. Right. You know? Right. And I, so there is a lot, a lot there right and so i i think kind of what we can sort of pull from this in my mind is that one at least and this kind of this actually really falls in line a lot with like what i think like history is something that should be toyed with it should be played with as a concept as well oh, yeah but then again too and, and that's that's kind of a very abstract notion um itself that's that's i want to say almost in some regards like relative relatively newly accepted or like really recognized yet yet at the same time not really but then like i think what you were talking about too this is where sort of marx is still very fucking relevant with with history is that there is still a very material bounds to what we could classify as history right it is an almost like it's just change right it's it's things that uh, materially, like we're 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 changing the exterior, and we're you know again this is sort of the the process of dialectical materialism, historical materialism, and, and how Marx sort of theorized how history is sort of pinned down, and it's it's like they're it, it's like almost and this is the thing why like history departments don't they they don't they don't talk about these things, and it's like almost we're at the point where like. I, I find a massive failing with history departments and their and their lack of actually um, understanding how history may be taught, like a meta history or like uh, again, like intellectual history. That's not very common. Like it's like right. truly people people don't understand that like history departments practice history within a very rigid set bounds of things and it never goes outside those bounds. And ironically, the most historical act is actually going outside those bounds, right? Yeah. There is a there is a, a sort of rupture that's happening, and that's I think in in a lot of ways 
a good way to um, sort of identify what history is. But again, to rupture anything, I think, right, requires some creativity. It requires a toying around. Um, this is, again, ironically, we're, I'm talking about how I really love a lot of like the, the concept of historical materialism in a Marxian context. Yet at the same time, a lot of very traditional Marxists are some of the most ungodly, uncreative people, and they're very dogmatic about how, like, oh, only it can be practiced like this. And the, the point, the point is, I feel like with with like, it's ironic because like, m- you know, Marx famously said philosophy is sort of like blah 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 blah. I can't remember the exact quote, but like the the point is to, is to change things. In order to change things, you got to change things, right? You got to change the the way that you did something, and that re- uh, involves creativity, not rigorous, quote unquote. What? Oh God, that's that that cringy term. People, scientific socialism. I, I I absolutely cannot stand that. I think scientific socialism is like the most insulting idea of socialism in my mind. But like, like, um, but that's just me. Um, and and I I feel like it represents a very rigid tone of like what quote unquote these systems can be and um again yeah the 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 best history is something that has to be toyed with and it has to be uh played around with and the same thing with philosophy right and that's a kind of a a big continental philosophy point but (laughs) yeah like it it is truly is you know the quote that you alluded to earlier is you know the philosophers only interpreted the world Mm. and that's a very in various ways the point however is to change it and uh this is just it's just kind of the way i mean it, it that that's that's at the center of a, a a lot of sort of i don't know just the way that i try and like be a person but <laughs> like which is good but you know i th- i think the most important part is that there's we talk about rigidity in, say, like a Marxist materialist lens or the, through the lens of historical materialism, the idea that history works within um, these sort of like it, the, 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 the not only that history can kind of be viewed in these various stages based off of the um, the tensions and changes that emerge from the mode of production, but also how history occur history occurs it's not just about documenting but but like what occurs when history is made is an extension from those processes uh in production um and now it is as we know you know with a lot of years in reading and research a great deal more complicated than this but what's what's significant about the ability to what well, what's important is that there have always been sort of new ways of saying i think the point that i really want to make is you can contrast a sort of rigidity in the sort of the the sort of like online marxist lens of we are you know, part of a historical process of uh, bourgeoisie versus proletariat, and and through the conflicts between these two groups at the point of production, will emerge an inevitable sort of collapse of capital, and out of that, or or through that emerges a socialist state that helps on a transition to the <laughs> abolishment of class, and you know, et cetera, and like, hey, you know, as a as a died in the wool commie, not died in the wool, uh, but you know. You know what I mean? As a raging red, as a raging communist, this is something that I'm in favor of. But in it is important that that we have the lens of the 20th century, and that history history needs to stand up and breathe within these ideals uh, it, as an affirmation of those ideals. And what I mean by this is is uh, it's it's not the trendy it's not the trendiest I mean, people don't assign him but when Walter Benjamin was writing about history and in this case a collection of uh, like this sort of like prismatic uh, surrealistic very much influenced by the surrealist sort of mm-hmm. a panoramic collection of notes that were past the bataille and told to please give this to Theodore Adorno as I run <laughs> away from the Nazis the poor guy couldn't you know couldn't catch a break in his entire life essentially right. but the year to like. This idea that there, 
we can exist as historical subjects in such a way that allows us to um even in the midst of some some what would turn out to be a historical low <laughs> period to say the least um even in in periods of like what his the, the stuff that has in the, the very center of historical memory like the holocaust and the rise of fascism in europe and stuff um within within the rubble of the past as jameson as jameson as benjamin was defining it um there's this ability of us to sort of reclaim time i mean to redeem time in a way that um can elevate the his, the ordinary displayed historical object to sort of can can place it within the process of history in a way that redeems it and uh the, this this is a materialist history that more interests me and not just because it's abstract uh and uh, not just because it accounts for um sort of like the, the capitalist tendencies um that exist sort of the sort of like if you stripped it if, if in a big if a big rain in a big noah incident if you will came and washed um sort of like re- allow our institutions to remain but washed away all of the excess and stuff stripped back in its basic forms and functions or whatever that like even within this as we were talking about earlier, this sort of like stasis we find ourselves in, um, you can find something worth redeeming. Mm-hmm. It is within that and an affirmation of that, that it becomes worth thinking historically. Um, and at the end of the day, like when it comes to thinking historically, if we're working towards some sort of a left political goal, some sort of collective goal, in opposition to the sort of atomized, individualized values that were popularized towards the end of the 20th century, then we should, I think, embrace these ideas as a way of seeing that can potentially give us, you know, help us not tread over the same shit over and over again. Not That's not to say that right. those who don't look at history are doomed to repeat it. I think that phrase is a bit nonsensical when you... <laughs> interrogate it for more than five seconds but you know what i mean right yeah yeah, yeah. um no that's that's exactly right uh that I, yeah and i it just it, it keeps it, it really it, it really always kind of just comes back to me I, I i think that the the lack of creativity when it regard like regarding sort of history itself um it seems like just a central area that is so present that uh it kind of kills me, but maybe I'm a little biased here because I find that in, and like almost, almost everything, right. A rigid acceptance of just what is without any sort of realm of questioning and how things do things. Right. And this is probably like the inner Freudian of me coming out. Right. Like this is the, the inner, like, like, okay, how as split subjects, do I understand the totality of what I am doing? Uh, maybe, and you can extend that further as split systems. And, you know, again, Zizek talks about split law, uh, regarding yeah. like how social orders and then like real life law exists. It's like, how, how can we understand, potentially understand the totality of what's going on and um i really i I can't help but that 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 just goes to examining meta narratives right like how like if we are questioning things what is the very core sort of theoretical narrative that we exist within you know like and that's something like god damn man i don't know about you academics just don't fucking do like ever like it's really really bizarre too because you would you would think that these people uh, most of them would like, um, you know, they, they've been introduced to at least some of these ideas, right. Of like core, very fundamental psychoanalysis and stuff you you really think. But then again, too, at the same time, these people are just probably doing their jobs and they're overworked and they probably don't even have, they they don't have room to actually practice their field. They have room. The only room they have is to produce. And that is to produce, um, students publish or perish. Exactly. You're completely right about that, especially. And when it comes to, there's 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 nothing 
to be found in the sort of way that people are doing things because they want to, you know, paraphrase one of my biggest influences of Marcuse. There's mm-hmm. a, there's a, there's a fatal union of productivity and destruction at hand here that is standing like that, 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 st- that stands and, the inv- the advancement, quote unquote, in and of itself, is standing in the way of an under of, of it, it's standing it's standing in the way of the how we could potentially liberate ourselves and free like potential from and it's it's it, for, for, you know for, free to free our potential and it's in this paradox that like stand so firmly against our ability to do to be creative and to do things to to allow history to assert itself as something incredibly radical with it considering our contemporary context exactly you know i i agree i'm super influenced by marcuse as well and you know it's kind of funny like i still think marcuse doesn't get talked about enough like i know he had his like heyday and what was it like the 70s during a lot of the student uh protests and stuff I really think though, like I really, I don't hear that. I I hear what you hear usually more about Adorno when it comes to like critical theory in the Frankfurt school. I don't hear about Marcuse enough. And I think, God damn, man, Marcuse is quite a bit more relevant than I think a lot of people would uh, give credit to, but that's my, it's my little love for, for Marcuse. I really, uh, you're just correct. You're just correct is the only thing. So yeah, like it's it's a shame being so right, you know? Yeah. And it's like, again, I think even, okay. So you, you really, you, uh, kind of remember recently, I think you said you kind of went through Eros and civilization again for anyone who doesn't know Eros and civilization is like Herbert Marcuse's like first major book. Like, this like i think what we're talking about is trying to understand narratives trying to understand the structures of what is like marcuse did that so well with like how he was describing psychoanalysis like to us like today psychoanalysis is something that is like it's rigidly individual right you're examining the psyche of the individual and marcuse is like what the fuck like hell no you're not like you're only indiv- you're only examining individuals as they relate to like superstructures and very sociological context right and that like yeah. like and it, and it's so true like I, I i i so i've okay i've taken i think two psychology classes and we never talked about freud as anything other than like a precursor to psychology but like yeah. uh, it, it, but like of course marcuse brings up like dude freud was a sociologist the best things about psychoanalysis is understanding how structures work how these sort of narratives work in a in a, in a more largely split context and and maybe i I think i think it's very smart to look at psychoanalysis as something a little bit hegelian as well but um i I think marcuse i think marcuse is is a really good example at like truly trying to sift through how we are thinking about things what maybe accurately can be said what these things are um and coming to creative uh synthesis is if that's a word i don't know but like like um coming to like terms with how to look at things in a newer light uh i feel like that's a it's a it's a little bit of a lost historical art when it comes to actual you know practiced academic history yeah there's there's i think what's incredibly important well first i mean you're completely right about the um the 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 changes in the in psychiatric practice especially in north america in the 1980s and the 1990s the psychologizing yeah. and medicalizing of the whole institution it was like it was it just it just it it changed and it it changed to that um suddenly and abruptly in such a way that like the the point of psychoanalysis and it is to it, it it became about sort of the transactional addressing of the symptom rather than about what it means to be free that is or very well said you know, that's probably it's, yeah <laughs> it's it like well thank you it has this like 
it has the, it's this it's the defeat it's the defeat of that whole change um it you know again sort of like we're talking about the like the paradoxes that Marcuse was talking about the 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 quote prog- the quote progress of the of the practice itself is what ended up neutralizing and like creating this bad stasis in the in the in the in the field itself to the point where like i mean you know like if you wanted to pra- if you're practicing practicing psychoanalysis and you're something of a lacanian basically the, the fun fact that people don't know is that you have to go like be rogue because people aren't you're not going to have the certifications necessary to be able to like be on people's insurance and like yeah. this isn't universal I but like i i know that like most people who practice some kind of lacanian psychoanalysis they're certified and you know educated and very good or whatever but they don't have the proper medical certification right. so as a result they have to you know you know be uh yeah you know you were talking about how um you know a lot of the core original like foundations of psychoanalysis is, is analyzing symptoms and how they relate to subjects and stuff and what what a larger system other than becoming a psychoanalyst and then having to rigidly like follow these tiny like te- not tiny these large textbook ideals and and um sort of uh rigid structures on how you should quote unquote practice these things and it's like it's just i think it's totally correct like i i am i'm really not a fan of psychology in so many ways like i i think it is uh, it's un and i think i think that's kind of a common thing among people who are kind of into philosophy and theory it's like oh my lord did psychology just go off the fucking rails with just super hardcore ideological like things and i that's the so, biological determinism makes me really uncomfortable in yeah. a lot of ways. And I think I think people have unfortunately fallen victim to that in a really brutal way to where we're just we end up duplicating these biologically deterministic discourses that don't have as that don't reflect as much of a universalizing and totalizing experience. And then sometimes in and of itself, it admits that it doesn't reflect this universalizing and totalizing experience. So it's this individuated universalization, which is just pure atomization. It's an affirm, affirm, an affirmation of the diagnosis, but in a multiplicity of the symptom, which like sometimes that's just how a psychiatric disorder functions. And that's OK. Some sometimes two two psychiatric disorders that's the frame like but that's with people who suffer from different symptoms that appear maybe to certain eyes radically different that's just you know categories and language we just are organizing things i get that but at the same time there is this like i am i am both please i i both am i i to we become affirmation of our symptoms diagnoses etc uh, as this like center point of being as a confirmation of our humanity rather than as just a framework through which we interpret and discuss what it means to be a person mm-hmm. you're not a person first which is like really bad <laughs> to me uh and some people would disagree with that and wouldn't like it and that's fine i'm sorry but like i don't like feel it it, it, it lacks a sense of agency that I think is important to not remove from people, but I think, you know, that gets removed from people quite a bit and quite often. Right. So I I suppose maybe we're probably, we're hitting sort of the, the end point, um, hitting the end point here. So I, I suppose maybe we could sort of sum up a little bit. We, we, you know, it's actually funny and I actually love this. I'm glad we kind of, we were thinking about, I think beforehand talking about like labor history i'm actually very glad we'd, we we've kind of discussed like meta history and i actually really yeah. like that we've discussed like what history is um it so i maybe to, to sum up would you say sort of history I, I suppose for for people listening history is sort of like a a foundational rupture of like stuff like ideas things institutions um for you is that is that does that sound correct how would you uh, yeah, it, it can it absolutely can be in part in what's important 
the way that I would history functions as an extension of human agency and that's the only way that it can function or exist now whether that agency is an expression of uh person sort of like person but not a human you know like not one individual person but some like an extension like say someone's really rich and they're able to sort of to to fund a large cultural product that dictates and sort of uh affects everyone's perception of a historical period time place person etc or whatever mm-hmm. um these are these are all still fun history exists as a function of as a function and an extension of human consciousness we we make history like w- w- like our agency is takes primacy in this like it, it, in in our attempts to try and live and act historically it's about you and you it's about the fact that you can go do things and have some kind of an effect regard despite our um sort of like the precarity of the political situation and you know wherever you sit on the political spectrum regardless i think there's a sense of removal of ordinary people from the stuff that happens that really like seems at this point like epiphenomenal stuff that just is so far away like really the world functions as an extension of like like 30 assholes <laughs> like they like that 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 have such a such a say in how things end up happening and that history teaches us that there not only is it possible for ruptures to happen ruptures are in some ways inevitable because there is always conflict uh above or below the surface um do you want to be a part of it is the question historiography is how it's written and talked about history in and of itself is something that we can go do and that's what i think is so exciting about it um is that we can we don't if we if we if we presume that there is this history stuff that exists and then comes along after us because people write and remember things then we can presume that it is that history is going to be defined by our actions and the actions of the people around us. We can then recognize ourselves in this sense of historical action or living historically through our sense of clarity that emerges when we experience his conflict. When you're if you're if if you're a worker and you strike in your workplace, um despite the risks that you and all of your coworkers, because you have good organizers, I've done labor <laughs> organizing, they would all, they're, they're all, you're all aware of the risks, but in a sense of solidarity, you step out in a recognition that you have an absence and an ability to make change on your own as a working person. And then if we can use all of this to try and define and demarcate territory of our own and traverse traditional boundaries, demystifying all of this stuff in the process. Um, I think that's something, I think that's, I think that's close to uh, the way that history, fun- history functions is that how does history function? It functions. That's really the answer. And it's mm-hmm. fucked up and people are going to be like, people are booing me. I, I can tell, <laughs> but that's really, that's just true. In the same way that our current economy doesn't establish as sort of fixed centers of power, rather power, it has centers of power, and these all of this stuff is like governments and people and stuff, and all that stuff is really important, but it's mm-hmm. spread so far to the like the all the way out past the sort of vision that we have of the horizon. Um, well, even within that exists your relationship to that process um so there's writing history there's historiography the philosophy of historical writing how do we write it how do we talk about history and then there's history itself which oh unfortunately that's just us so that means we gotta do stuff i if we want to make things happen I like that a lot. I, I think you've also thought about that a lot more than me. I think there's a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of cursed being a content creator and someone who's always having to read. I, I like Mark Fisher kind of talked about people who are the most quote unquote 
productive. They pacify themselves and being able to communicate these things. You got to have time to sit on things. And I just don't have time to sit on things. And I think you've, right. you've, uh, you've done an extremely good job. I think that's a really, I, I never totally thought about it in that language. I never toyed with it in that language, but I really, um, I really like that a lot, but, um, you know, I was just going to say, thank you. You know, thank you so much for coming on, dude. I, uh, I've been thinking about having you on a podcast or doing something with you soon. Um, I'm, also i think is you know a big fan um and for anyone else i'm actually a, a patron of kyle so you guys anyone watching this you guys want to check out his channel consider supporting on his patreon i'm a i'm a fan man i haven't seen your last video i've been so incredibly busy um but uh i, yeah. I appreciate it. i think if people like if they like your stuff they'll like my stuff it's it's my it's 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 similar but with what if you took all if you took the epic philosophy channel and s dumped it all into like a bucket and swirled it around and mixed everything up a little bit and then dumped it out in 10 to 15 minute segments those are my videos uh it's a grab bag of whatever comes to mind that's awesome <laughs> yeah you have you have more uh you have more balls than me when it comes to video creation because i am like Oh my god, I'm a dirty careerist YouTuber. I have to like be careful. <laughs> I have to be careful what videos I make. Like I, I, but I went outside those bounds with like the video I made about Disco Elysium. God damn it, man! I want to do so much more applied theory. You do a lot of applied theory, um, and I love. We'll have to. Yeah. We'll just have to collaborate on applied theory. Let's do it, man. I, I'd be more than happy to do that sometime. So, but you really should. All right, so I think we're probably. I don't know. Is this an hour mark? Whatever, but uh. Anyways, yeah, I definitely just want to give you a big, uh, big thank you again, and obviously just give you the right shout out. Um, yeah, man, I guess I'll uh, end the podcast here. So again, thanks so much, uh, and for anyone watching, thank you guys. So.